You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. The other thing we're building on is God's Word, and that's a consistent that we're always building on God's Word. And this season, we have decided to walk through the book of Exodus. And if you haven't got your copy of the book of Exodus yet, there are a few copies left. We're going to order more this week, but uh, we want you to track along with us using this, this ESV uh, study Bible, and it's a journal Bible. And what it is, on one side, you get God's Scripture. On the other side, you get an opportunity for you to take what's on the screen or what God's speaking to you and to write in there. And we're hoping and praying that this will become a real treasure for you, something to go back to, and we want to do that. The other thing we're doing, uh, we, we've never done this before when we've done expository preaching, preaching through a book. We're asking you and letting you know where we're headed. We want you to pre-read what we're going to be studying on Sunday. So this week, we're studying chapter 3, and we asked you, hopefully a bunch of you have pre-read chapter 3, and as you do that, next week will be chapter 4, for example, and uh, as you pre-read, God's already stirring, He's laying a foundation, and it really fits with that idea, build from here. And so as we've done that, as we've started already as somewhere early on in the book of Exodus uh, in your copy, you should write that Exodus is a story about God. This is the kind of the big picture. This is where we started a couple weeks ago. We said Exodus is a story about God. It's about God and um, who God is and how he works. And we, we're going to see some incredible things through the book of Exodus. The second thing, and I wrote it right in mind, it's also a story about God's people. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, write these things in because you'll be able to go back to those and, and right at the beginning saying, hey, this is what the story of Exodus is all about. The next thing is on page 26. I want you to turn there with me. Um, on page 26, we're in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8 really speak to the overall theme of Exodus. And we said that Exodus... Um, it, if God were to speak to the, today uh, vocally and audibly, he, and if he was talking about Exodus, he would say it's a story uh, where I am the living God and I care about my people. And so what I did on my Bible, I circled that section. I put theme for Exodus. Exodus. I'm not telling you what to do, but you ought to do this. Um, but, uh, and I wrote, I am the living God. I care about my people, dash God. And again, you'll be able to go back to that and understand kind of what God is doing. But we've said that it's a story about God it's caring about his people. And then the first few chapters, uh, first two chapters in particular, we were asking last week the question, where is God? And because it's interesting that when you start reading the book of Exodus, it's a time of trouble. It really is. It's, uh, there's hard labor. The people of God are under oppression, serious oppression. There are babies being thrown into the river, uh, being killed. And you might have asked the question, did God just disappear? Did, we know there were 400 years between Genesis and, and Exodus. What happened? And then this so-called deliverer, this baby is born and protected. His name is Moses. And in chapter 1 and 2, Moses ends up running for his life. Life, and if you're saying, where is God in this story? What's happening here? And in chapter 3, when we turn there, we see that it turns from just not only God's people, but a really a specific story in chapter 3 about God and about Moses. And we see Moses in chapter 3 as a shepherd, and he's working for his father, Jethro. Uh, how many have ever seen the hill, Beverly Hillbillies, right? Jethro. That's where my mind goes. Uh, and in verse 1, though, it says that Moses is on the west side of the wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. And when you see that he's in the wilderness, you're thinking, what in the world is going on in Moses' life? Well, he had ran from Egypt. That was his home. 
where he was connected with his people. And when I say his people, there were actually two groups of people that were his. The Egyptians, he was raised by the Egyptian uh, royalty, and, and so those were his people. But he also was connected to the Israelites. He was born an Israelite, and, and so he, he cared about those people, and he's separated, and he's running from them. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 30, it's not in, it won't be on the screen, but Acts 7, verse 30, we read that there's 40 years between Acts, ah, I keep on saying Acts, between Exodus um, 2 and 3. 40 years between these two verses. And we see Moses here in the wilderness. And I don't want to read too much into this, but I'm thinking Moses, for 40 years, had had a call on his life and really kind of ran from that. He had a call to save the people of God, and his first attempt was a flop. He ends up killing a person, right? And I'm thinking now he's in the wilderness, and could he be experiencing some shame, some hurt, some, uh, some pain in his life? He's a shepherd, and that is definitely not what he was raised to be. He was raised in the Egyptian royalty, and, but now he's a shepherd. He's doing what he wasn't called to do. And in a lot of ways, you look at Moses and his life, he's living this life of monotony until he has this epiphany in chapter 3, the burning bush, the famous uh, story there. But before we get to the story or the details of what happened in the burning bush, I want to just point out something that was very interesting to me between chapter 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, we ended last week looking at these verses. And I just want to read these. It says, And God heard their groaning, right? That's the people of Israel. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel. God knew. And out of that, we see three kind of key points. Let's put those on the screen. Exodus 2, 24 and 25. God heard, he saw, and he knew. So when you were asking, where is God? Well, he shows up at the end of chapter 2. But now we've gone 40 years, and in verse In chapter 3, verse 7, the Lord is speaking to Moses on the next page. Look at it, and you might want to circle these or highlight these. Uh, It says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their suffering." And so again, we see almost the same progression. He heard, he saw, he knew. God was watching. And then in verse 8, we see what God's plan is, and we're going to talk about this in a second, but it says, I have come down to deliver. So out of the wilderness, where you're saying, God, where are you? And the reality is, we all have moments in our life that feel like a wilderness. Dry. Maybe we're disconnected. Maybe we've made some mistakes. Maybe we've fallen away. Maybe there's been tragedy. And what's interesting to me is that in all of these cases, God is watching. He knows, even when we're facing our own wilderness season. Well, there's a family in our church that has gone through uh, one of the most horrific uh, experiences last July. Uh, And it's taken some time for them to process, but earlier, uh, a few weeks ago, um, Adam Carafel reached out and said, Pastor, I feel like I've got something to share. I want to share part of our testimony of what God has and is doing in my life. And and so we looked ahead and I said, hey, when you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 7, the burning bush story, does that relate to you? And and he, he got back with me and said, yes, absolutely, that God has seen, he's heard. And I know they're suffering. And we want to share a little bit of their story in two parts. And so the first part's coming. And Carafel's first service was incredible. Thank you for sharing in advance here. Let's watch the first part of their testimony. We are Adam and Tracy Carafel, and this is our story. It was a normal day for us. Um, What would end up being um, the hardest day that we have ever gone through in our life. And the day was July 28th, a Wednesday, um, seeming 
basically just a normal day. We both worked a full day, came home, and uh, brought the kids back from daycare. We had two young foster daughters. Um, but that day, we had an accident in our pool, and we lost our 13-month-old to a drowning. I've never felt more dependent upon the Lord and more helpless in myself. We are uh, here today to just testify to God's goodness in the midst of our trial and everything that has transpired since the day that we lost our precious Allie. You know, she was a foster daughter, but we didn't think of her that way. We didn't love her that way, and we didn't treat her as any less of a part of our family. And the whole family just truly loved her, just like she was one of our own will forever be impacted by her life. And I believe that from the love that she gave and the life that she lost, that people are going to be affected on the other side of eternity when this world is gone. You know, through the gift of life, she became an organ donor. And so part of her lives on in somebody else today. And we can't fully comprehend it or understand, you know, why God allows tragic things like this to happen. Accidents have a way of having ripple effects that project into people's futures. And they can destroy lives, they can destroy marriages. And we know that, we've, we've heard, you know, statistics horrible statistics saying, you know, um, that our chances of staying married are very good after losing a child or that, you know, um, mental instability and anguish from grief can just bring a person to their knees and make them unable to cope with life. But God had a different plan. I believe that Tracy and I have such a testimony and that God has been able to keep us and to help us through the hardest thing that I believe a mother and father could ever go through. And we're stronger because of it. And I believe we've been able to commit ourselves to the Lord in a way that's enabled him to do what only he can do. I love it. That's the first part of the story. We'll get the second part here in just a few moments. But the, again, in Exodus there, God sees, he hears, he knows. And then in the next verse, he says, I will deliver. And uh, the Lord has helped you. He's delivering you. He's, and he does the same for us uh, no matter what we're facing and uh, what a story. I do just want to just echo uh, the, the beautiful part of the story. And even as we did the funeral right here in a packed house, um, Allie's life uh, is living uh, through the gift of life. And that was a huge, huge blessing. Praise the Lord. We'll get to the other part of that and we'll see how it all comes together here in a second. Exodus 3 is one of those famous portions of scripture. It's the burning bush account. And we see that God pursues Moses. Moses is doing his thing. He's shepherding. He's in the wilderness, uh, probably not thinking uh, about his future at that point all that much. And God comes after Moses. And we're going to see two things that really stood out to me um, in, the, in the text that we're going to see kind of, a, it's just repeated over and over, kind of back and forth. Um, but apparently, the Lord wants to get our attention at times. And I believe this morning, God wants to get our attention. And so don't think you're exempt. God is trying to get your attention. This could be your burning bush moment. But in that, we see two things, again, that will happen over and over. The first, and you might want to write this in, is that the Lord reveals his presence 
And then the second is that he reveals his purpose. And when we look at that, we're going to look at both of these kind of back and forth. You'll see that there are verses that will magnify these. And uh, these are the two things that God is wanting to not only do what he did in the burning bush account, but he will do in our lives as well. Let's look at the first one. The Lord reveals his presence. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Boom, there you go. An angel of the Lord appears. God's presence comes. That phrase, angel of the Lord, is seen 67 times in the Old Testament. And you say, what is the angel of the Lord? Or what is, what's happening there? Well, some would call it the angel of Jehovah. Or they, some would say the angel of Yahweh. Uh, some uh, theologians call it a theophany, where God appears himself. Others would call it a Christophany, where Christ is, is it's Jesus Christ pre-incarnate uh, coming. And, uh, and there's different debate on what's actually happening, but we know that there's a supernatural uh, experience here with Moses. The presence of God comes. Verse Verse 3 and 4, then Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned up. So what we see, we see this supernatural thing, the angel of the Lord appears, and then Moses turns aside, and then look what it says. I love this. It says, and when the Lord saw, apparently God was watching Moses to see what he would do. But when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside, repeating the, that phrase twice for emphasis, God called him out of the bush. And he said this. Uh, he said, Moses, Moses. And he says it twice for emphasis, kind of like he did in Gen uh, Genesis 22 with Abraham. He said, Abraham, Abraham. Or Jesus did with Martha, uh, Martha, Martha. Or with Simon Peter, he would say, Simon, Simon. And certainly you could read into it kind of an intensity, like, like almost like he's trying to get his attention. Moses, Moses. But I read it a little more like there's an intimacy that happens. And that's why Moses turned aside and he noticed he was able to gaze on the angel of the Lord and to hear what God said. I just want to say that, that moments like that, happen every single time we gather. And whether you're gathering online or gathering here, the Lord is in our midst, and it's important. The importance of worship, the importance of a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, it all, all those things gives us opportunity to see and to hear. But in this case, the Lord says, Moses, Moses. And then he goes on to describe and draws them in and says, Look, you're, you're standing on holy ground. Verse 5, look what it says. And he said, here I am. That's Moses. And then the Lord said, do not come any closer. Don't come near. Take off your sandals. Take off your feet. Or take, off, take your sandals off your feet. Excuse me. <laughs> For the place where you're standing is holy ground. And as I've been studying this, I don't know about you, but my mind goes to the old song, uh, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Does anybody know that song? A few of you. A few of you don't. I thought, I, I was singing out loud earlier this week, trying to be loud enough so Bobby could hear, so he'd get the word from the Lord that we wanted to sing that. And he apparently never got the word of the Lord, but I thought, hey, I'm in charge, and I'm the one with the microphone, so let's just sing it. Let us praise Jesus now. Oh, this is good. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. Some of you have no idea what we just sang, but it's an old hymn, and it talks about being in the presence of God. And Bobby, you must have just missed it this week. I'm sorry. But I love it because his promise, the promise of the Lord comes and there's this intimacy, there's this holiness. And yes, God is a friend, Jesus is a friend, and yes, you can defend that thought, but don't be too casual because when there's when God shows up, it's a holy experience. The sovereignty of God, the transcendence of God are still a thing, right? And so we gotta be careful. 
God. He's still God. He's holy. And then in verse 6, it says, and he said, I am the God of your father, the, of God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses, what did he do? He hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. There was a moment there that he realized this is serious. God is getting my attention. And apparently, when God wants to draw near to someone without destroying them, he sends the angel of the Lord. And maybe the angel of the Lord will appear uh, to you uh, as well. So the Lord reveals his presence. And then, in the next couple of verses, we see that the Lord then reveals his purpose or his plan. Let's look at it. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. That's where we were kind of honing in with the Carafel story. It says, And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their suffering. And I love that. And then right after that, we see the plan that God gives as they're in the presence of God. Look at it, verse 8. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. We see the plan of the Lord being described as Moses turns aside and is in the presence of God. And then in verse 10, it says, Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. When I first was reading that and just putting myself in Moses' shoes, and my first thought was, yeah, that sounds great. God, choose me. But that's not what we see with Moses. And he's saying, uh, in verse 11, he's saying, who am I to do this? And I thought, you know, with Moses' past, and even in my own past, in my own life, things I've struggled with, I've wondered, God, are, you know, when God says to do something, I'm saying, God, are you sure, right? And you're saying, who, me? <laughs> and God's saying, yes, you. And then you say, couldn't be. And then God says, no, you, <laughs> right? And, and the idea is that, that Moses was kind of disqualifying himself. He's saying, no, I, I, I can't do this. And he has doubt, which is typical, right? He's saying, I could never do this. And actually, the rest of chapter 3 and, verse, and chapter 4, we see a list of different excuses and, and different things. But uh, I really had a moment with the Lord this week when I, when I was reading this and just studying this, letting it sit on my heart. And you may want to write this in your, in your copy. I, I wrote that when God chose Moses... He really magnified the truth that God never wastes a season. Forty years in the wilderness, so to speak, running from where his home was. But God finds him. And God says, you know what? I'm using you. And it's interesting that Moses would lead the people of Israel into the wilderness, a place where Moses was familiar. And even the mountain where they end up, uh, Mount Sinai in chapter 19, is where Moses would take them. That's the mountain where, where this bush was on fire right at the foothills of that. And so we see God's purpose, right, is being revealed. Not only his presence is there, but God is showing Moses what the plan is. And the plan is very similar for Moses as it is for us. When we engage in God's plan for the big uh, reason that why we exist, we exist to bring people out of bondage. It says in verse 9 that the people were being oppressed. And just like Moses was to be a deliverer, we are called to make that connection with people that are far from God and say, you know what? You, you can be free from bondage. You can be free from sin. And that's what our call is as well. Last one there, Exodus 3, 12. It, and he says, but I will be with you, right? That's the presence of God with the plan. And this shall be a sign to you. So he's saying, hey, this is how it's going to happen, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, the mountain of Horeb or the mountain of Sinai. Uh, it's the same mountain. And, and he says, look, I'm going to bring you back to this place, and it will be proof that I've been with you through the whole time. His presence 
his purpose, his plan. And then it goes back in the next couple verses to his presence. Let's look at it. Exodus 3, verses 13. Pick it up there. But Moses says to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses is kind of saying, I'm not sure this is good, but if I go, who will I say sent me? And look what God says. He reveals his presence here. He says to Moses, I am who I am. I've got that underlined. You want to underline that, circle that. It says, he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's powerful. I am Yahweh. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent you, and this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So what happens is Moses gets this revelation. It's revealed his presence. He says, you know what? My presence will be with you. I am has sent you. I am who I am. His presence, the presence of the Lord, is all that Moses needed in that moment. And it's all that we need when we are in a situation where we are in trouble or there's tragedy or there's, there's uh, situations that are difficult. And what's crazy is that in the presence of God, even in a difficult situation, we get our purpose from the Lord, but it comes from being in the presence of God. And in that presence, that the presence of Yahweh, that we understand really who God is. And he says right there, I am who I am. This is the God who is, who was, and is to come. This is the God who is eternal, the God who's the creator, the God who's a sustainer. He's the God that's full of truth and defines existence in reality. He's the God who never changes. He's the God, the only God that we need, the God who is I am. And he's available, and we get to meet him in his presence. God reveals his presence to Moses and God is revealing his presence this morning to us as well. And obviously that all of this is happening while the bush is burning and, or the, the flames are burning, the bush is not being consumed. But we see not only the presence, but again, we see the purpose. From verse 16 to the end of the chapter, so the rest of this time, we see a prophetic word given to Moses. The prophetic word actually started in verse 10 in the NLT. It says to go and to lead the people. But look at it in Exodus 3.16. He says to, to Moses, Exodus 3.16, he says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your father, has appeared to me, and I've observed what's happening, and I promise that I will bring you up out of that affliction. He starts by saying, go and gather. And then in verse 18, he, it's prophetic. Uh, it's, a, it's a sign of what's to happen. They will listen. Look, it says, and they will listen to your voice, verse 18. And it's interesting that later we'll hear that, that <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry, that uh, Moses is complaining. He said, you know, I don't really have a, a smooth speech. I, I stutter or I, I've got this uh, this problem, and but it says here, they will listen to your voice. There will be authority given by God Almighty. I love that. In verse 19, uh, it describes that there will be some resistance. They're not just going to say go, and that's the, the story of the Exodus. But then the Lord, again, prophetically, his plan, his purpose is revealed here. Verse 20 says, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And so he says, I will strike Egypt, and in the same process, I will bring favor to the people of God. Verse 21. Uh, verse 21 talks about favor and about the promise of God. And all of this comes. Excuse me. When God says, I am who I am, will be with you. Yahweh will go 
with you. This story of the burning bush is not just isolated in Scripture. The presence of God is there, and the purpose and the plan is given. And it's interesting to me, going back to the Carafel story, that it's in some of our most difficult seasons where the presence of God is the only thing that gets us through. And we want to watch the second part of the testimony from the Carafels, and then we'll tie it all together. Here we go. We had suffered job losses, and uh, Tracy was unable to work for the last six months and so we had a great financial need and at every turn God was there making a way when there was no way and as a husband it was hard to accept that I was unable to provide a Christmas for my children or the furniture that we needed so desperately because ours was ruined by dogs and children and stains um, those of you who have kids would understand. You know, some things, sometimes things happen and furniture needs to be replaced, repairs around the house need to be done. And we had all of that happening at our house over the last six months. And every dime of it has been provided for. I didn't earn it, but it was provided for. As a man, I take pride in being able to provide for my children. And, um, Receiving so much uh, from so many people is so humbling. And um, it's hard to accept um, just because of my pride and my ego. Doesn't want to admit that I need help sometimes. Um, but God has me in a place right now where I'm in, I'm in need of his help and his grace to carry us through this transitional period that we're in as we're still grieving the loss of Allie and um, suffering from, from job loss and the inability to um, make ends meet. And this past Christmas, you know, we were able to celebrate with presents around our tree and all of our children home with us. So Christmas morning, you know, we're all sitting on these couches and you just have to stop and look around at everything we still have. You know, when you experience loss, you can't forget everything you still have. And we have so much. And we had an amazing Christmas on our new furniture, presents under the tree. And there's a lot to be thankful for. We're able to celebrate with presents around our tree and all of our children home with us minus our sweet Allie, but we know that she's with our Savior, and that brings us comfort, and we're just so, so grateful, and we want to thank every one of you, each and every one of you that has given to us and helped us through this time, and I just want to give all the praise and the glory where it's due, and that's to Jesus. Because without his hand upon us, who knows where we would be today. Come on, let's just thank the Carafels for sharing. Incredible testimony. And I just love the thought that God, uh, he knew exactly where you were. Uh, he, he saw you, he heard you, and he knows the, uh, the, the trouble. And I love that uh, you gave all the glory to Jesus. You know, bring it back to Jesus. And the truth is, is that the presence of God, what Jesus does in our lives, is what really, really matters. He helps us through. This morning, we're studying the burning bush account that is a significant story in Scripture kind of one of those standouts that you learn as a kid, maybe over and over. If you've got a children's Bible, you know, it's one of those stories that's not going to be missed. You're going to read it and reread it. And it's a supernatural story where the angel of the Lord comes, the, the bush is burning but not being consumed, and, 
And I was just thinking in membership class, we talked that we, that we, we serve a supernatural God. So there should be no question. There are no, like, uh, you know, people sometimes will question, like, did that really happen? I mean, we serve a like, God can do anything. And so certainly God could show up, the angel of the Lord, and the, the bush could be burning. And Moses sees something unnatural, right, happening. And the truth is, the same thing can happen in our own lives. Will there be burning bushes in your life? Yes, there will be. And they'll be the kind that fit you, that speak to you in your life. A burning bush type of scenario is where something not normal appears or happens. The pandemic, I think, as I was studying this week, I just see the pandemic in a different light. It's a burning bush experience, and God's trying to get our attention. God wants to speak to us. See, God sends burning bushes to us all the time. It could be through a person, through a trouble, through tragedy. Sometimes it's just through deep emptiness. But in every case, God wants to get our attention. And I don't believe that, that some commentators will say when it says Moses, Moses, that he like, you know, was screaming or like yelling or raising like this loud thunderous voice. I just, I just believe that, that when I've dealt with the Lord, it's more through often a whisper. And he whispers so he draws us close. So I just see it, Moses, Moses, and he draws them in. I was remembering that uh, when I, my kids were young, I did this with Reagan and Logan. Um, I would, uh, when they were little, I would whisper gibberish in their, in their ear. I'd go, and then I would say, once they were close, I'd, they, I would say, I love you. And I would, I would do that a lot. I haven't done it in a long time. But uh, <laughs> Logan's here. He's 18 now. You probably think I was a little strange, but maybe later. But uh, <laughs> but I loved it. And I, it, what it would, it would draw my son or my daughter in close. And they would listen. How often will these burning bush experiences happen? I don't know. We don't know. But will they happen? Yes. And again, they will fit you. It's God's way of getting our attention. This morning could be a burning bush moment for some that are here. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, it's a burning bush moment. And the word of the Lord is today is the day of salvation. See, we've got to be aware of the presence of God. And it's in his presence that he reveals the plan, the purpose. I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me this morning. We've created some space here at the end of the service to do two things. One is to have a salvation call and then also to respond in his presence and listen to a song that will speak to us in regards to his presence and being with God. But let's talk about the first part first, salvation. If you are here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we want you to to find Jesus. That's why we exist, to bring people in relationship with Jesus. And uh, it's really simple. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior today, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. This morning, more than anything, your greatest need, if you don't know Jesus, is to find him. And today, right here, you can find him your head bowed and eyes closed if you're here in the room you're saying pastor um, I, I don't know Jesus as my personal savior or I'm away from God and I need his saving power would you just lift your hand right where you are if you're online you can type in the chat saying yes that's me who here at second service would respond to a salvation call saying yes that's me I need the Lord to save me see any hands 
in the room, unless I'm missing someone, but online, if you're responding, certainly type in the chat, I need Jesus, and we will reach out and get you resources. We'll follow up with you every time. That's our greatest need, church. But after salvation, even serving the Lord doesn't mean that things are always going to be just right. Sometimes we end up in the wilderness like Moses. Sometimes we face things that are really, really hard, like the Carafels. And today, God wants to get our attention, and he wants to speak to us. He wants to speak to us and reveal himself and his plan to us. And so what we've done is Pastor Bobby has uh, asked the team to lead a song that speaks to being in the presence of God. And I want you to pay attention to the words of the song. And you can stay seated for the majority of the song, but uh, God wants our attention, and he's getting us, uh, giving us our attention, or he's getting our attention through this song as well. Let's enjoy, let's worship the Lord and sing this together. Some of us have been walking our own path or our own way, or maybe we've been complacent, or maybe we've been stuck. Maybe we've been trying to do it on our own, God, and just make us aware of those burning bush moments, those moments of disruption in our lives, those moments of disruption from the routine. God, make us hear what you're trying to speak to us in those moments, God. And so many times, like Moses, our response is, who am I? Who am I to overcome that obstacle? Who am I to believe in healing? Who am I to believe in a miracle? But in those moments where we ask the question, who am I? We thank you that your response is, remember who I am. You are the great I am. You are the I am God, the God who was, the God who is, and the God who always will be. You've always been there, that there's no wasted moments in our lives. You are the I am with you, God. And you are here, you are speaking, you are moving, you are intervening. And we just pray that you would move in our lives, that you would move in our circumstances, that you would speak life into us. Because it's in your presence that we find our purpose. So let all that we are be consumed by who you are and let everything that's not of you melt away. For your glory and for your honor so that we can leave this place and be light in the darkness so that we can leave this place and bring hope to the hopeless. That it's through these burning bush experiences, it's through an encounter with your presence that we find our purpose and that we are sent to help bring deliverance to others as well. And so we pray that you would use us, that you would move through us, and we know that as you do, that you will be before us, behind us, and all around us every single step of the way. Jesus, we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory and all the honor. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week for service. Uh, we look forward to doing Exodus 4 with you next week. And if you're new to us, make sure you check out the Connection Center as you leave. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.